The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Chris could not be here. I was asked to stand in for him. So this is his presentation mainly. So if there's some parts of this that I'm a little shy on, you know, please forgive me and give me a little patience there. Chris, he's a professor at our military academy at West Point. I'm at the United States Army Engineer Research Development Center in Vicksburg, Mississippi, along with Robert Moser and Brett Williams, are my colleagues there. We work closely with Chris on many topics and many things. As you know, West Point is our academy and uh, the Corps of Engineers, so we're kind of somewhat sister organizations and work rather closely together. This is an application of ultra-high performance concrete, which we'll define in a minute, that Chris has brought up in this dry cask situation. And Chris is the idea person here of trying to, let's look at the concrete that's going into these dry casks and how can we improve it and what can we do to make this a better product overall. So introduction here, a little bit of issues with the dry cast storage, of which some of you may have to help me on just a little bit, but new material selection and about our ultra high performance concrete materials and what we're doing with that, our development of that and the microstructural characterization of those materials. What is ultra high performance concrete? That's a good question. We'll get to that in just a moment. As everybody's been saying, you guys know all this part, right? Got our reactor core. We have our rods coming out, your secondary storage in your wet pool, and then into your dry cask, as you guys are very familiar with. And Chris's idea here is to improve the concrete in this from a couple of standpoints. One of them is to make a better product overall, a much more high-performing material to where possibly incorporating different types of materials in there that we know over the years can help with shielding and stuff, reduce the cross-section of those. By reducing the cross-section of your overall cask, you can put more of them in an area. That's one idea we're trying to think of and he's thought of to try to mitigate some of those issues and storage issues. I know that continues to be a problem, evidently, and then also the long-term storage of those materials. And basically having a concrete that's a little bit better, stronger, and higher performing. You guys know all about this. You know, we've got this spent nuclear fuel that we're having to deal with and it gets generated year by year. And Bottom line is the moon pools, as you know, only have so much storage capacity. We've got to get them out to the dry cask and move them out, and we're in a lot better position to safely store them and also recovering things of that nature. We look at things from in the Army, of course, worried about terrorists and people using these in a wrong fashion and taking this spent fuel and doing something with it that we would not like them to do. Dry cask considerations. Licensing requirements to NRC, so this is the part, you guys, if I got some things wrong here, you know. We now know that the cast themselves and everything has got a lot of jobs here, okay? It's got to be resilient, of course, against Mother Nature, whatever I'm going to throw at you. Tsunamis, well, you've seen what the results of that, right, over in Japan, unfortunately. A terrible thing to happen. Radiation attenuation, of course. Heat removal. Your neutron absorber must last as long as your cask. All these types of things that you've got to do. And again, we're talking years and years and years. Now, we've talked about this 20-year business and all this stuff. But the real problem is the fact that we know that 20 years is the, we're talking about the item itself, right, the dry cast. The material that's in there, its half-life is thousands of years, right? So that's our real big issue is how are we going to deal with this long, long-term problem? We've got some literature here about the shielding business, and we're just looking at the shielding and stuff. We've done shielding work at different sites from our laboratory at the URTIC, the Concrete Materials Branch. Our focus is concrete and other materials, but our main focus is concrete, grout, cementitious-based systems. We've done work at Hanford. We've done work at the WIP site in devising uh, expansive salt concretes for some of their plugs early on, and I think they went a different direction with that. We're working with Oak Ridge, Yucca Mountain, trying to devise systems, everything from shotcrete to concrete plugs and things of that nature to deal with the shielding and stuff. 
So we know historically, we've got reports from the 50s, even out of our branch, dealing with this, heavyweight aggregates, things like this. So us concrete folks, you know, we've been dealing with this for a long time. There's all kinds of things in nature that can help us by using the right materials, plugging them into the system, can give us the shielding business. This is how we build our reactors, heavyweight aggregates and things like that in our reactor shielding and things of that nature. Now, it sounds like so far that concrete, you were saying earlier that using normal construction and they use high quality concrete techniques and things like that, which is good. All we're saying is, and I think Chris's idea here is just put a little bit more thought into that. How can we really improve this concrete to give us a really better product and give us a higher performing product? And it may take using some of these traditional materials to do that. So optimize the concrete for radiation shielding. We want to minimize the volume and weight for required level of attenuation. Relatively easy to construct with high probability of homogeneity. There's long life expectancy, low activation, easily recycled, cost effective. So we build this dry cask. We use this high performing concrete in there. But we're talking about the licensing of the 20 years, additional 20 years. What happens after that? Is this thing starting to degrade? Do we need to now take it out of service? What do we do with those materials that are making up that dry cask? We maybe take those rods out, maybe put them into another one. I don't think we really fully understand that. Or maybe we'll get good service out of it. It can stay there for 100 years. Who knows? But in doing that, what we're saying is what we need to do is put some thought into now what are we going to do is maybe possibly recycle some of these materials that we already used at the first time, like some of these concretes can be recycled, possibly, and all these other things to minimize the volume and weight by using a high-performing material. And we do a lot of work in the Army about ballistic protection, as you can imagine. That's a big push for us. So we have kind of been thinking about this, and we have some products that have similar the goals of them are very similar to what we would want for a dry cask. Self-consolidating concrete, which most of you are very familiar with, you make sure that you've got no vibration, we got good filling, the fluidity of the concrete and its fresh properties, we're completely filling the dry cask. Fiber reinforced, and then the ultra high performance concrete and high strength, high ductility concrete. Different combinations of these may be an answer to us in helping us out in this situation. But it is ultra high performance concrete. I'm on the committee for that. And right now, we've got out for public comment through concrete terminology. I'm going to read this because it's been changed a little bit. Concrete ultra high performance. Concrete that has a minimum specified compressive strength of 150 MPA or 22,000 PSI with specified durability, ductility, and toughness requirements using reproducible test methods. Fibers are generally included to achieve specified requirements. So the bottom line is you specify durability, ductility, and toughness requirements. So you want this concrete inside this dry cast to basically be durable, be tough enough for the, whatever you're going to put onto it, radiating it, the heat, those types of issues. There has been a lot of work in this area, initial research results. There's some work presented here at ACI a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, University of Utah, looking at these things of trying to optimize the aggregates you would put into a dry cask and things like that, which aggregates attenuate better. So there's lots of information out there that's been done, and Chris is continually doing uh, research into what goes on with all these things and doing literature reviews. Let's talk about this UHPC now versus NSC. We think UHPC may be a helpful answer to these dry casks. Just to give you an idea of the cross-section there, the UHPC on the left, the cross-section of NSC is normal strength concrete. Let's just say five, 6,000 PSI, just everyday concrete. You can see some of the uh, differences in compressive strength and the densities here. A little bit higher on the density, and one thing about it is we do incorporate in a lot of our products as steel fibers. So we get a little bit of kick in our density because of the fiber loading. And it's a significant fiber loading, generally more than what the manufacturer recommends. Some of ours approach about three times the recommended amount. We use construction grade fibers in some of our materials. Some of it's a higher grade steel. But the bottom line is that's where you're getting the kick in density. However, there are higher density aggregates that we could put into these, and we'll talk about that in a second, that would, of course, kick it up a higher rate. But just to give you an idea of just the cross-section, and the biggest difference here in most UHPCs on the left there is look how small the grain sizes are. And you got the coarse aggregate in conventional concrete, NSC. And that's the really big difference. There are some UHPCs that have coarse aggregate in them, but very few. That's the one big difference you'll see there, and that's quite obvious. 
We've done decades of R&D on development, characterizing, testing, modeling, and fielding of UHPCs. We started working on these back in the 90s. As you can see here, we have a material we call Core Tough, as you see there, C-O-R-T-U-F, and we can produce this in the back of a ready-mix truck. It's fieldable, and we do do this on a semi-regular basis. Us, we are R&D lab, we're not a production lab, but we make a fair amount of this for continued testing. And as you see, we can get strengths in excess of 30 KSI and has high toughness and durability, and that is due to the fibers. It does have a 3% fiber loading. Concrete, as we all know, is a brittle material, but the fibers help with that in making a more ductile material. We also have done a lot of durability studies. We gave a paper earlier this week about ongoing studies we have. We have a natural weathering station at Treat Island, Maine, which we subject the concrete to natural weathering, freezing and thawing in salt water, I have an island off the coast of Maine have this thing, which is tremendous. On average, 100 cycles of freezing and thawing in a winter. And again, salt water, so we're looking at chlor. So we have these down the lower right-hand corner here. These beams here, you can see the beam here has been cut, the bar removed, there's no corrosion. Those beams had been in salt water, high and low tide, freezing and thawing at this time, I think for 15 years. And no surface scaling. No air entrainment in this. Why no air entrainment? Look back at this. There's very low porosity and it's basically impermeable compared to normal strength concrete. This is a very, very competent normal strength concrete, but water can move through this and it cannot move through this. That's the big difference in these materials is that they're so impermeable. And that impermeability, the ability of water to not get in there. We've done chloride diffusion tests and at about these beams, when you get in about eight millimeters, the chloride diffusion has stopped. There is no more diffusion. And with two or three inches of normal concrete in a marine structure, I think three inches is a normal cover. That beam was purposely put three eighths of an inch away from the surface to see. We figured, yeah, it's going to get in there and start corroding it and rusting it. Well, it did not. And these beams are ongoing. Mike Thomas with UNB is going out and sampling these and it just finished taking some uh, additional testing on this and reported on this this week too. Our very high strength concrete called VHSC is what kicked us off on our UHPC road back in the 90s. A couple of our researchers were working on this and through an iterative way of mixed proportioning, it was mixture number 247 that got them through the results they wanted. A lot of work went into this. This is back before we had all these wonderful particle packing models and things like that, or they were early age on. But needless to say, they did get it to work. It places, it looks like this when placed. You can see here it is going. This is with fibers in it because, look, there's no reinforcing steel here. It just has some light bar reinforcement here for it pick points to pick this slab up when it's finished. But this is full, it's about a 3% fiber loading in this, and this is the kind of workability that we can get with these materials. And then this, we also cast, and these are some of the beams at Treat Island that we talked about a minute ago. The really neat thing about this is a revolving drum mixer or a ready mix truck placeable. Most UHPCs are mixing a very high shear mixer, and that's a big difference in getting these out. All right, so new materials development and testing. So that's always ongoing. Chris had the idea of how can we twist this UHPC formulation to go into a dry cask? How can we help the dry cask community? And one thing is just increasing the density by using steel sand. And when I say sand is a size fraction, sand is not a chemical definition, okay? It's a size fraction, okay? We all know that. So this is steel, actually steel shavings, and it's a waste product that we basically got for free from a manufacturer. And it's a powder metal supplier. And he was using some of the products that they didn't want to try to cut costs down and things like that. But we do have a normally silica sand in there. We took that out, replaced it with the steel sand, and also with our steel fibers. He also looked at a uh, normal strength concrete as a control. So what we did, we put all these together, and the microstructure here, you know, is a typical is you have your coarse aggregate, fine aggregate, you have paste, and you have porosity. Some of these, you see the little air voids here. That's normally what a normal concrete looks like. Now this is a, a CT scan of what a normal concrete would look like. We have a computer tomography scanning system in our lab and we take this, this is what a normal strength concrete would look like. So he says, okay, now let's look at what core tough would look like, our UHPC. So we now take it, we look at some scanning electron micrographs of what our core tough looks like and some of the chemistry of it 
These are some of the fibers. This is really getting down closer and closer. Looking at this, this is a fiber particle here. And our typical UHPC microstructure is fine aggregate, silica flour, paste, and fibers. And you can see here, a little bit different. It's kind of hard to see in this slide, but it's vastly different from this. And this is darker because it's so dense. And then what they did here was they took out the paste matrix, and this is what the fibers look like inside there, distributed inside that cylinder. And you can see they are just typical hooked-in steel fibers, just construction-grade fibers that we use for this. So the microstructural characterization of core tough with the steel sand. Now we're adding the steel sand to it. You can see, of course, it's going to give a very different scanning electron microscope photo here. And to where now you see all this steel, which now, of course, the steel gives a very good pinging on, just like the fibers do. So as the x-rays are going through, taking their scans of this, and this scan takes a while. It takes a better part of a day to do this, and it's a lot of data. So now you see this, and look at this, and how I highlight it, the x-rays are really hitting on the steel sand, and then showing a few voids in here. Then we're doing this with the core tough UHPC with steel sand and the fibers. So we're adding now, combining steel sand in the fibers in our core tough, and the difference here. So here's the steel sand. Here is the fibers, if we take the matrix out, and here is the combination of the scan. Just to give you an idea of how all this goes together. It's a pretty complex microstructure there. So because of all of this, all right, why are we doing all this? Again, is to attenuate. Chris is also doing Monte Carlo in particle transport code. He put in all of his functions into the characteristics of the materials that are going to making this. And he has his attenuation versus concrete thickness. Now, this is what his model gave is the blue line. And it's, well, it's hard to see. The physical attenuation of this test here is this little blue dot up here. And he got 100% attenuation at about five and a half inches. Now, his hand calculations were a little bit lower. The model was a little bit lower. And that's something he's looking at. But the actual test itself with the source worked really well. The chemical composition of the UHPC required as input for a simulation. And the porosity distribution is also characterized. And then... In this, and let me read this part here because this is the part that his cadets worked on. They presented this at the ANS student conference, and it's, they used a, a cesium source for their attenuation experiment. And they were told at that student conference that this wouldn't work because the concrete was not durable. Well, we tend to disagree with that, but <laughs> anyway, you can see here the linearized, he got his counts, he linearized them versus thickness. And you can see here, as we top off, it's pretty small, but the regular concrete's up here. Core tough is here, without any kind of uh, steel sand or anything, just with the silica in it. Core tough with fibers does a little bit better. And then now we add the steel sand. We have UHPC with, or core tough with steel sand and steel sand and fibers. So bottom line showing that we're attenuating more and more and more as we get that steel in there for shielding. And it worked really well. And these are some of his numbers. And you can see here, UHPC with the steel sand and the fibers, we got 229 MPA, a pretty significant amount. And they also were looking at other materials to put in there to optimize it. And we do a lot of characterization at our lab. We do a lot of mixture development. That's kind of our theme. So we're now we're looking at going back to some of those older reports as, you know, what are other things that we can add to this, like your bayrites, your magnetites, hematites, things like that, boron carbides, you know, what can really start happening, we put in here. Now, part of this is the particle size distribution. That's a big deal to us in putting together a UHPC mixture. To make one work, we do a lot of work as to all the particle sizes to make them all go together and have a nice fit. And that's a very common thing to do in UHPC. But some of the materials that you get may not optimize into a good mixture. So there is a lot of playing with that. And that's based on the materials as received and what you can do with it. And sometimes you can make a mix work and sometimes you can't. And you may have to shift the sizes fraction that you're buying or something like that. So just understand that we are looking at different materials like that, or excuse me, Chris is, to try to improve the attenuation. So UHPCs, unique class of materials with dense microstructure, low interconnected porosity, high strength and high toughness. And just trying to optimize these and adapt these for use for attenuation. He got up to a 50% observed in various testing with the mechanical properties went up to. And other dense particles can be incorporated into UHPC to improve the properties. Now, a couple of questions have been asked this morning about shrinkage. Now, UHPC's biggest problem is probably autogenous shrinkage. 
because of all the fine product, all the very high cementitious value with things like that. But with the combination of the fibers, that can be optimized. A dry cask is the definitive shrinkage ring test, right? I mean, you look at a dry cast situation, that's what it is. It's a shrinkage ring. And it's going to shrink. It's going to crack. And you're exactly right. So what we need to do is think about how to minimize that in the materials that we pick. In ultra-high performance, it's not just about strength. We kind of use strength, but as I read to you in the introduction, it's not all about strength. It's also about what you're asking that concrete to do. We're asking it to attenuate. Maybe there's some other things we can put in there, to, like shrinkage-reducing admixtures or some other things, fibers, hybrid fiber systems, combinations of sizes of fibers to help minimize that. UHPCs have an extremely low water cement ratio. The one that we have here ranges in about 0.16 to 0.20, let's say. It's extremely low. We use atmospheric steam. We have a steam plant to steam it. But a lot of times you can use the inherent heat from the product itself to, in essence, cure itself. Anyway, there's a lot of things that you can do with this, and Chris is just trying to expand that and, hey, let's think about this, and maybe we've got some answers here that could possibly help. Chris's future work is to continue to expand his literature review and resolve the issues with his modeling program and kind of understand why his model is not quite showing what the actual measurements are, and then use that MCMP to guide optimization of mix design. So for future materials, put some ground truth into his model to where he can now run some different materials through there and save a little bit of money as far as instead of having to put mixtures together. But you still have to put mixtures together eventually. <laughs> That's where we come in.